everybody. My name is Katherine Gomes and I've put together just a little presentation on how to teach multiplication and division at home. I am so excited to be here with you. This is kind of like my big event today. So feel free to send me messages in the comments. That would be a little bit of much appreciated adult interaction. But I want to just show you um, some different ways to teach multiplication and division to your kids. Just some background on me. I was homeschooled, I had a great experience, and then I went to the University of Pittsburgh and studied mathematics, and then the University of Pennsylvania to study math education, and I just really learned that how we present math to kids can make a really big difference in how easily or how effectively they learn it. And now I'm so excited, I was able to write um, some math curriculum for Apologia. So Apologia Math is coming out this spring, levels one and two, and you can get all the information about that on their website. They have free samples you can download, and we even put together a really fun like April math activity calendar. It is National Math Month, everybody, so let's celebrate and do some math activities, and hopefully that's helpful as well if you're at home. But let me jump in here to talking about multiplication and division. So first of all, I just wanna let everybody know that the jump from addition and subtraction to multiplication and division is considered by most researchers the biggest cognitive leap for your kids in elementary. It's the hardest thing for them to grasp. And I think as adults, we can think of it as very simple, but it really is a lot more abstract than addition and subtraction. So it's important and worth it to take our time in how we present it and to really practice it well, because if they get a solid foundation in it, it's just gonna set them up for so much success. Also, I have some good news for you. What you need to teach them in third and fourth grade, I would suggest, are all the facts up to 10 times 10. So lots of people say 12 times 12. I mean, even I have a set of flashcards here and they've got like five times 12 and 12 times eight. Everywhere you look, it's the times tables up to 12. So um, if you're curious, that actually is rooted in the British monetary system and 12 pence or something like that, that we don't use. And we're just been a little slow to change. So you do not need to teach your kids uh, the 12 times tables. If you want to teach them the 11s, because they're kind of fun, that's fine. But really all they need to know is up to 10 times 10 and then the division facts that go with that. And what I would recommend as a timetable is, a sort of a timeline for that, is in third grade, we're introducing these concepts and practicing them. And then in fourth grade, we're really mastering it so that by the end of fourth grade, you your child has their facts down pat and they're ready to go and launch into fifth grade and sixth grade without that being a hindrance to them, okay? All right, so how do we wanna teach it to them? Well, I have some things to show you here. So let me just flip this around. Okay. All right, see all this fun stuff I have? Ah, oh, I had a great time setting this up. All right, so when you go to teach uh, multiplication to your kids, um, the very first thing that you want to do is work with equal groups, okay? So we like to use beans uh, at our house. They're really inexpensive. I don't worry about losing them. And the first thing I would do is set up equal groups. You can only multiply if we have equal groups, okay? And ask kids to find the total. Now, when they go to find the total, they are probably going to use repeated addition, right? Three plus three plus three plus three plus three. And that's what you want. You are not at all looking to introduce like three times five or the time symbol. Way too abstract, okay? We want to build on what they already know. So let them do that repeated addition. They'll start to see patterns, okay? Make your lives a little easier. Get some things to organize these groups, okay? Uh, an egg carton. You don't want things rolling all over the place. You can use rubber bands. Uh, we bought, I bought this, this ice, this is an ice cube tray. As you can see, it's well loved. We use this for so many things. And this is how we organize our groups just to help mommy, you know, not lose it with beans rolling all over the place, okay? Um, M&Ms can be a great thing too with equal groups. This will ensure that they really do make all the groups 
equal. So you want to do a lot of practice with that. Um, in level two of Apology of Math, we have them already starting a little bit of practice with equal groups and repeated addition. Uh, I'm just laying the foundation for them so that they're getting ready for that concept later on. Once you've done lots of practice with this and let them touch and feel those beans and look at the totals, then you can move on to repeated addition with a number line, all right? So this, this is actually also taken from the second grade book. We make this really cool, like, foldable number line. It's accordion style so that it doesn't take up your whole house. Um, and number lines, I tell kids, are just a way of showing numbers, of showing the representations. They're a tool. That's what number lines are, just a tool we use. So I have a paper clip here. Uh, there's a couple different ways you can do this. If you have a printable number lines, you're going to have the kids actually draw the jumps to show the different groups of three. And when they've done five jumps, they will find the total, right? Uh, here, if I wanted this to be reusable, it's, it's a little tricky to do with one hand, but um, I would be sliding it. Okay, three, six, nine, 12, 15, okay? Realize we're starting to build up to multiplication, but it's really gradual here, okay? Um, all right, so you've got your number line. You've done your equal groups. Another great one is arrays. Oh, I love these guides. They're so fun. All an array is is organizing objects in equal rows and columns, like, like straight rows and columns. So you can use anything. I have Play-Doh. If you join me on Monday, you know I'm obsessed with Play-Doh. We use this for addition and subtraction. This is Kool-Aid Play-Doh. I can, I can barely resist like playing with it. It feels so good. It smells like pink lemonade. So kids build three by three, and they're seeing that three times three is nine. And they can count it up if they need to, right? That's the whole point, that, that since it's concrete, they could fall back on counting if they needed to. Linking cubes, we use this for addition and subtraction. We want to get our money's worth, right? You can use linking cubes for arrays. They're great because they stand up nice and straight. You just don't want things that get out of order, okay? So this is a two by three array. Here's another one. I love these guys. I invested in these inch square tiles for my math class at my co-op. I can't remember. I either got them on Amazon or Rainbow Resource, but they weren't that expensive. So I made an array with these, and the kids can find the total of 15. Great thing about these tiles is you really get bang for your buck because you can use them again to do area, perimeter. You can even use them to measure, right, if you line them up. So this one's a lot of fun. Okay, so we did the groups. We did number lines. We did arrays. Spend some time here. Really soak this up. Have your child really playing with this, experimenting with it, and then they are ready for abstraction, which means the actual facts, okay? So we've built lots of four by five things. We've made groups of four, groups of five. Now we're getting into the facts. And this is kind of where... Um, Multiplication and division differ from addition and subtraction. It really is more abstract, and you can't continue to fall back on your manipulatives and your pictures for too long. There comes a point where we just have to know 4 times 5 is 20, okay? So when you get to that point, there are some strategies for learning these, okay? You want to group things into fact families. You're probably familiar with this, right? You learn your fours together. What I recommend is you start with the simplest ones. Start with your twos. Learn all your twos facts. Let your kids practice those. They can kind of fall back on doubling. Learn your tens, right, because those are pretty fun, quick and easy. If you learn your tens, it's not that bad to learn your fives. And again, lots of practice with those, and then add in your threes, your fours, probably your nines next, Sevens and eights are the hardest, okay? And if we're going to practice these and practice these, we want to do some games. That's the next thing I want to show you. So you can just have your kid flipping through flashcards, but it takes so much practice to learn these facts that I would highly recommend you add a little bit of fun so that they're willing <laughs> to practice as much as they're going to need to. So let me just show you flashcard war. So simple, right? Uh, each person flips over a fact, 
This is player one. This is player two. Okay, 10 times four is 40. Seven times four is 28. They have the higher product. They win the cards, okay? And it gets fun when you tie, you know, not just with the same fact, but you have uh, different factors of the same number. Then you have to declare war and go from there. So that's a good one that's not too tricky, that adds a lot of interest. I have another one I want to show you. Let me just set it up. So you need like some gridded paper or graph paper, okay? Uh, I called this one, what I call this? Greatest area. Uh, you can make up your own name if you want. So let's say we have an orange, player orange and player green, okay? You can use dice. You can use numbered cards. I'm going to use dominoes just to make it fun. So let's say that it is the, the green player's turn. They pick a domino and they're going to do two times two. So anywhere on the board here, they can make a square that is two by two and color it in with their color. Now from there, they either count up the squares if they're not as strong with multiplication or they do two times two. Whoops. My pen is dying here. And they write the product, four. Two times two is four. So you keep playing until either you fill the board or you can set a time limit if you don't want it to go on forever. And then you add up the, t the total areas. You could have your kids practice their addition there. You could yet let them use a calculator. That's okay. Whoever has the greatest total area wins. Something that's fun with this is you can limit your fact families. So like, you know how I said before, you want them to just practice their twos until they have that master? You could do this with just twos facts, uh, whether you're using flashcards or dominoes or dice. You can kind of limit it so you're not necessarily doing seven times eight on this board. That was a lot of fun. It's pretty simple, okay? All right. Well, what about division? So an interesting thing and a really important thing to remember, let me just flip this around, to remember about division is it's the inverse of multiplication. I'm sure you all know that. But what's really important is that's how you present it to your kids, okay? It is not helpful when we teach math uh, in a disjointed way, okay? So I, I see this all the time. I did this. Uh, I learned math. It's not helpful. So you don't want to teach multiplication as this, like, isolated skill. Like, here, kids, here's something cool we can do. We can multiply. And then you're like, oh, chapter five's over. Let's do division. And there's, like, no connection. That's kind of like if you were teaching a kid how to dribble and then you taught them how to shoot, and then you taught them how to pass, but you never taught them how to play basketball, all right? So for you to really be teaching mathematics and creating mathematicians, they have to know the connections. So when you teach multiplication, you do that repeated addition to see the relationship. When we go from multiplication to division, you really wanna emphasize that it's the inverse. It undoes multiplication, and I would recommend using the same kinds of representations that you did for multiplication for division to kind of emphasize that relationship. Let me show you what I mean. It kind of sounds like weird and abstract until I show you. All right, so remember we started with the beans, right, for the multiplication. So just do it backwards. Instead of giving them the groups and have them find the total, you count out, you know, a total that divides evenly. Don't give them a remainder. Don't make their lives miserable. And you say, hey, kid, you know, wonderful little person, make equal groups of three. How many groups are you going to have? All right. And so then they make the groups and they're like, oh, if I have 15 and I split it into groups of three, I have five groups. All right. You can also say it the other way. Um, you can also say make five groups. How many will be in each group? You want to kind of say it both ways so they get used to it both ways. Again, you know, use these things to organize. With your number line, this one's a lot of fun because it's like so straightforward. Remember we went up when we were multiplying? So, okay, 15 divided by 3, you're just counting back. Jump back, jump back, jump back. Do you see how that shows them how it's related? Multiplication is like repeated addition, kids. Division is like repeated subtraction, splitting it up, all right? With your arrays, uh, if you have an array, instead of looking at the total, you're going to be asking things like how many rows will there be or how many columns. 
If I have 15 tiles and I arrange them like this, you know, in three columns, there will be five rows. So that's how you kind of use that to represent division. Now I'm gonna show you some games, but this is really important. If you do nothing else, you will make me so happy. Send me a message and I'll give you an air high five. <laughs> do some type of game where they have to match related facts, okay? So they can get the relationship. So, you know, most kids, how they memorize division is using the multiplication fact, right? That's how we do it. We think of the multiplication fact. So you can play go fish. You can just do straight up matching where they have to see, oh, I get it. 21 divided by 7 is 3. If I say it the other way, 3 times 7 is 21. That one right there is gold, okay? All right, um... What about a fun game? Uh, let's show capture the square. So I picked this one because I'm really trying to show you things that like whatever you have at home, right? I get it. I don't want to give you something that requires an extraneous target run. <laughs> All right. So here's your game board. Um, to make your own, you could go online and search for like dot paper to make your life easier. It doesn't have to be this big. I printed off dot paper and then in the center of each group of four dots, I just put the numbers one through 10 randomly, okay? So uh, let me just demonstrate how to play. So if I was the first player, I flip over a division fact. 20 divided by four is five. So I need to find that quotient on my game board. Um, I have lots of fives, so I have different choices. I can put a line next to any of these fives. Just like with regular capture the square, if you close the square, you win that square. You get a point. Okay, so there is some strategy. What's amazing about this game is you can limit your fact families because it's the quotients. It's not the facts. So you could play this game using only twos division facts or only tens. Or you could even have your older child over here with a pile of division facts that have nines, eights, everything. And then over here, your younger child is only playing with twos, fives, and tens, and it still kind of works out evenly. So lots of fun. Okay, one more thing I want to show you before I close out here. And I should say, you know, if you have any questions or anything like that, you can leave them in the comments. I'll circle back. Like I said, you know, I'm happy for some adult interaction right about now. Okay, so I have a project here that kind of rounds this out. So in this project, I had uh, kids make a poster, one for multiplication and one for division. There's a lot of great things about it. One is the poster forced them to use all the different representations, okay? So they wrote their own word problem in the middle with a little bit of help and scaffolding or you know, I showed them sample word problems. They got to write about something that was interesting to them. They have the, the you know, the notation up here. Here's your equal groups. Here's your array. Here's your number line. All on one poster. And then when they present this, they get to use their, their, their vocabulary, factors, products, those type of things. It's a great skill. And then, of course, with division, similar thing. Write their own Word problem in the middle. We're showing it a bunch of different ways. In this poster, um, they use the bar model at the bottom. That's another way you can represent. Here's their number line, okay? So putting that all together, this students who can create a poster like this really get what they're talking about. All right, well, I hope that was helpful. And, um, you know, I would just encourage you to really take the time and invest the energy into representing multiplication and division in this kind of rich way with hands-on materials because it makes such a difference for them in the long term. All right, well, thanks for joining me.